because it's still not a very wide um, term that people really understand. That sometimes people think that we are special, and we are kind of special, but not that much. Um, we are like any other doctor. Um, I have a lot of families and friends that says, oh no, I'm, I'm just 80, I don't need to come and see you. Well, it's not about being 80 or being 60, it's about you know, being the need, or maybe find someone who you can maybe have an opinion or develop a relationship uh, in terms of physician and patient for a long term. So, let's get started. The lecture uh, was pediatricians versus primary care. So I kind of decided to change it and wrote it as pediatricians as primary care or pediatricians with primary care. So we really can work with anybody. We can be a primary care, we can just do a consultation one time, uh, or we can um, just work with the other consultants. So we shouldn't, you know, it's not really versus, but we are part of it. So these are going to be some of our objectives today, and they're pretty um, broad, and we will talk about uh, what is the training as pediatricians, what is the role that we have as a primary care, what is a consultant, what are the trending populations um, statistics in geriatrics, and also, of course, how we can help. So what is it, who is the pediatrician? So, a pediatrician is a physician, a doctor, who had completed residency training. A residency, we call it, um, when we finish medical school, we are, you know, here in Texas, what he was called a GP, general, general practitioner. Um, I guess some time ago, people really didn't have to go into residency. There's some people that are still GPs, but nowadays, since many years ago, after medical school, you went into a residency training program. So you can become board certified. So we geriatricians are either internal medicine or family medicine training. And then we have an additional one or two years of what we call a fellowship. And that's what we do our fellowship in geriatrics. So you will find doctors that are family medicine doctors, base training with that fellowship in geriatrics, like Dr. Usher and myself. You will have internal medicine doctors as the base training, and they, they have their fellowship as geriatricians too. So, with both primary care doctors. So, this additional training it is very important because we focus in the concern of older adults, not only the medical, but the psychological, the emotional, the social needs. So, if you are getting a little older, you um, have a little bit more problems with medical issues, you may want to think about um, seeing a geriatrician. Uh, this is a number. Each day, 10,000 people, 10,000 people of the baby boomers turn 65. So uh, when I read about these numbers, because I forget them, right? And it just makes me come on it, like, okay, this is it. You know, there's, there's just like, the tsunamis here. You know, we're not, none of us are getting any, any younger. And um, there's even more. So, that is one of the big reasons that this specialty is just more and more important. Not just this specialty, but also people who train in the social workers, um, nurses, psychologists, like everybody who's going to deal with seniors, family, of course. People over the age of 85 now are the fastest growing segment of the population. So that means, and it has to do with a lot of other things, you know, we have less kids. I came from a family of six. My mom had nine four, and we're six, and I have two. Okay, and it is not rare nowadays that we have one, or two, or none. So, Really, 85 and older is the fastest segment growing up in the population. And that's a true statement. So it's not very rare, and you probably know this very well, to see people with longer than 100. 
You know, before that I was like, oh yeah, like, you know, the grandma or grandma should be a hundred. But now it's really more common. And you know, they're 95, they're driving around, they're, they're going to grocery shopping, they, they're doing their golf twice a week. I mean, it's just what it is. So, another number, shopping number here. And just tell me if I go a little bit fast because we're just going to talk about all this. And if you have questions, just raise your hand when we, uh, you know, we call and we can address that. By 2030, the last of the baby boomers will reach 65. That's hundreds of years span. The U.S. population, age 65 and older, will be more than 7 million. So that means it's going to double the number in 2000. So there's going to be a lot of us. And a lot of very close to that number too. So the, again, the need for healthcare um, coordination and people who are training in pediatrics will be very high. Um, I mean, it's high now, it's just going to get more. So we just talk about what we do when we specialize in caring for people 65 and older. And just as a pediatrician cares for the needs of younger people, you know, we do care and attend the needs of older people. And many times when I said pediatrician, of course my accent, they're like, oh, pediatrician? No, no, pediatrician. So we just have a job and say, like, we have to wear the EG. <laughs> but you know, there are a lot of similarities sometimes because we have to deal with families and, and so on in, in some events, but this is quite different. So we approach each patient needs very individual. You know, we um, think and, and we were trained to have the knowledge and the expertise that is needed for this care and accommodate the seniors. The geriatrician can also assess um, better some of the geriatric syndromes. And we call them syndromes because it's not like having a sore throat, you have a pharyngitis, or having a flu. These syndromes are, in medicine, what we call something that has many different components. You can't just fix one thing. So, memory loss, depression, urinary incontinence, falls, I'm pretty sure you know you all learn about falls with that question. Arthritis, whatever kind of arthritis it is, osteoporosis, asylum disease. So there, there are different um, geriatric syndromes that we are, I mean we're trying to this, that's what we did. Uh, the pediatricians uh, often uses behavioral approaches and try, we try as much as we can, um, to use non-pharmacological approaches. Um, it is very common. We tend to think twice about putting another medication on top of another medication or to fix a side effect of one medicine with another medicine. So we, we do the attention to that. Um, we clearly see that um, we did all these pro problems and we not only assess the medical needs but also the emotional and the social needs of the seniors and vice versa. So basically that's exactly what it says in that slide. We collect information, so it is not rare that the first time you see a pediatrician, and I have patients, younger patients, you know, the 60s, they or the late 50s, they're still working, they do this, they do that, and they're like, why do I have to do all that information? Like, you know, where do you live, and where's your house, and who lives with you, and uh, where do you get your medicines, do you have your transportation, um, what do you do for radiation, I mean, we try to get on that because we, basically that's the way we are trained, that's what we, you know, that's what we do. Um, because it is important for patients to have access to all those things, and for us to know what they're able to do, or not to do, or their families, they have support. You know, what do they do uh, for fun? Where do they take them? Do they go to an adult daycare? Do they have to take uh, you know, a bus and then another bus to go somewhere? So that is important. We have developed and expanded expertise in the aging process. 
and this is one of my favorite fancy medical words. Sometimes when we don't have a very definite answer, we say, well, it's the aging process. And we really try to talk about, you know, why do I have senior moments? Why I don't remember sometimes um, the name of, you know, my dentist? I mean, you know, what's the difference? And, and, and we work with patients and families and explain that, you know, it is an aging process. I'm going through an aging process. Every single day that we live, we're going through an aging process. And there are a lot of changes in our body. I mean, we're not the same 10 years ago. You know, I, I always talk about my knees because I really miss my good knees of 20 years ago when I was able to grow faster and, and longer. And, and that's just how it is. And just how to adapt to that is very important. To have the knowledge and the education. The geriatricians also serve and see patients in different settings like hospital, clinics, long-term care, like nursing homes, rehab facilities, home visits, and we do terminal and hospice care. So we see our patients and we're familiar with all these settings and we try to work with that. The pediatricians are also often involved in ethical challenges, ethical issues, <coughs> because um, sometimes these issues come up and we try to represent what is unique in seniors, you know, what is what, what are the ethics and we we don't have the answer many times, but we can put things into perspective and we can talk about those issues because we're familiar with those. We are kind of um, known as team players. Um, we really do have to be a team player if you're going to be doing um, healthcare for seniors. But we have to work with other doctors. Um, and it's not that, oh, don't go and see your urologist. Or, you know, you don't need that urologist. You don't need No, no, no. It's about team paper. We work with families. We work with social workers. With the pharmacists. Calling up the pharmacist. Hey, you know, this medication, do you think this is this is something that it could be? You know, we don't know at all and we don't have problems asking. So we are very uh, trained to do this. Talk to nurses, to the therapists, the home health agencies, the hospice care, the families, the son from California who, you know, just showed up after 10 years. I mean, we we you know, we do all that. We try to do this in ways. So how we can help, and we just keep talking about the same thing, what we can do, what we can do. Well, these are some of the things that I just want to uh, focus, you know, we talk about memory loss, difficulty with balance, false pain, and uh, we went over this kind of slide. Um, this is a little bit more expensive because we do the end of life, the elderly abuse, even though it's sometimes <coughs> a kind of a big elephant sitting in, in some people's houses or, or some places. Um, that is an issue. Um, legal documents, how about currently living wills, you know what happened. We're not attorneys, but we let you know, you know where to go and what we need to fill out in order to have your papers ready and in place. Agitation mood disorders, and I'm pretty sure you guys all um, listened to um, Dr. Weiss for the dementia presentation and the behaviors uh, for the dementia patients, and we, you know, we, we are trying to do that. We also um, we do family conferences like any other doctor do, but very focusing what's going on. Um, we discuss placement issues. It's not common. We always talk about you know when we think and you know my mom is my sister living is doing this or when um, end up in the hospital now has this. What is the time maybe that is going to need more care? What are my options based on what we have? We can also assess on decision-making capacity. And when I say decision-making capacity, I'm not saying that we assess competency. Competency is a legal term. And if there are lawyers in the room, then they want to know that. So we doctors can say something like, patient is able to make decisions, patient is not able to make decisions. 
Uh, and we, we do have a technical way of doing it. Um, but we can assess you know, that. It's not, it's not a problem. Navigation of the healthcare system from the hospital to the skilled rehab facility to the assisted living or to home, the home health. Um, all these transitions, visiting the other consultants, you know, the cardiologists, what did they say? They changed this, they changed that. Um, that's coordination of care and community resources. The adult daycare, the senior clinic centers, memory care, and care that takes place, you know, all these places for, for, for seniors. So we try to um, have information ready for the seniors to, to do the this. So I want to touch a little bit, um, just extra slides on some of the big ones that um, we identify in geriatrics or um, the way that we can assist. Medications is one of them. Um, among the other ones that we said, medications, we really are, I don't know, I think we take pride in interview medication list and then we are um, a little bit also be about, okay, what is this medication for? And what is this medication for? And many times, you know, people have to take a lot of medications, but at least we really try to look and say, you know, what's going on? The majority of seniors and patients with three or more chronic illnesses, we take at least five medications or more. And when I said three chronic illnesses, you know, I'm talking about probably blood pressure, cholesterol, arthritis. Blood pressure, cholesterol, diabetes, osteoporosis, osteoarthritis, and hypothyroidism. I mean, you name it. There's three, you're already on five medicines. That's just very common. That's, that's what happened. More than eight medicines in a day, it's a red flag for diabetes. And Medications have multiple interactions, as you all know. And the adverse drug reactions of these medications are actually among the top five greatest threats to the health of seniors. So that means many times, and we do try, we do have um, or both, you know, harm, you know. But many times, you know, medicines really can harm. So we really have to assess the risk and the benefits and make informed decisions about what we're doing, what we're taking 8, 10, 12 medications. Memory. Um, you all have a lecture already. So we talk about causes, management, short and goals, you know, what is it, um, what is most likely, what are our goals short term, what are the goals long term, what are the treatment plans, placement planning, concrete needs, and mood and behaviors. Um, that is another really, really big one. Um, Dr. Rocha talked about falls. We just keep talking about falls. This is false. These are the good falls. <laughs> so these are, these are the ones we like. Uh, the other ones we don't. So she talked about that um, for some time. So we're not going to talk. Um, but that's exactly what happened. And this is just what it represents, care coordination, and that we really, you know, have to work with families and case managers and social workers and psychologists and psychiatrists. If we have them, because as you all know, you know, we need more psychiatrists, but we do work with all of the other doctors and, and so on. Multiple consultants. It is not uncommon when a senior is admitted to the hospital, you know, we get the cardiologist, because they have a the regular heartbeat, or they have a heart attack, or the neurologist for the stroke, or the orthopedic doctor that did the hip because they fell and broke the knee or broke the hip. Um, we get the hematologist because of anemic. We need the kidney doctor because the kidney is failing. We need the pulmonologist because the COPD is acting up. So it is not uncommon to have like three or five consultants I and mean, somebody in the hospital. Uh, so we coordinate that um, multiple consultants. Then the transitions of care, going from the hospital to the skinners of the city or to home or to the rehab or whatever. And we really try to focus on priorities. What is life expectancy? What is what is more important? You know, quality, quantity, um, what is the prognosis? Short term, long term, what are the goals? What is going to make the patient happy? What is the family want? That's, that's exactly what we do. The end of life issues is still very common. I think um, probably, um, would you guys raise your hand who has?
passed on something about living wills, advanced directives. I guess this is a biased group. <laughs> <laughs> you guys all do it, you know, it's pretty good. It was a good, um, you know, that's great. In the community, it's not like that. Um, you know, that is it's very challenging. People put it off, put it off, put it off, and we get a phone call from a lodger. Hey, we need you to testify more. Like, what? Because there's family issues, there's somebody, and somebody signed something, and the other one doesn't think that they should have signed it, and it's just uh, a chaos. So we can help with that, we can assess with that. Hospice and palliation for terminal illness. Um, even though I don't think, um, I, mean, I personally don't like that we work, but you know, death is part of life. And um, we do take care of hospice, radiation, and homework. And we do that all these with conferences and so on. So my talk was pretty short. And I just want to leave you with this information. And among ourselves, pediatric medicine among all the medicine people, we have one of the highest level of job satisfaction among our peers. And uh, I'm pretty sure we all love what we do. The cardiologists love cardiology, the immunologists love immunology. But um, I don't know, I haven't seen the statistics, I haven't seen them either. So that's a good thing. And that's my family. That's conclusions. And uh, if you guys have any questions, yes. Yes.
you have a uh, brochure at the end? Oh. Thank you. Was it someone else around here? Yes. Okay, thank you. I guess sometimes medical term. Palliation is um, is comfort. Comfort measures. Yeah. Yeah. Doctor, I was just wondering, how long does it take to get into your practice? Because we have seen with specialists here in the San Antonio area, like in neurology and geriatric psychiatry, it takes three to four months to get in. Oh well, we're pretty new, so you're pretty lucky. You probably can get pretty fast. <laughs> yeah. It was like, I don't know, probably a week or two weeks. Yeah. There are also, because of, uh, if I can interrupt for a second, um, there are patient centered medical home models, which means that they take um, extra time and extra care, and they're the captains or the coaching of the team that Dr. Starr was speaking of. And part of that model allows for same day appointments. If it's the first appointment, it would probably be about a week, but follow up appointments. Thank you, Annie. I have another question. Yes. So, when my doctor, when my father, his doctor is a primary care physician. Yes. So, he gets his blood work done and stuff like that. So, is that something geriatricians do as well, or we would still need his primary care for that? Um, no, I mean, like I said at the beginning, we can, the geriatrician can be the primary care, or the geriatrician can work with the primary care, depending on the need. But we are, we are primary care. We, Feel the medications, we see the patients for the diabetes, the blood pressure, so on, you know, every three months. That's, that's just your father's decisions about staying or um, looking for another doctor's pediatrician. Yes? So, do you find that the specialists in San Antonio are willing to work with you? I mean, do you find that it's easy or what has been your experience? <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, well, we try to be persistent. Uh, um, you know, it's like everything. We're all human. Everybody's busy. Um, takes time to go through phones and, and faxes and request records. But I'll tell you, 99% of the time, if I pick up the phone and I get the right phone and call somebody and get them on the phone, they will answer my question. You just need to chase them down. <laughs> I have a question. Um, my mother is suffering from dementia and she has a wonderful um, primary care physician who has been her family doctor for years. So, right. Um, and he, you know, she's very comfortable with him and he's got a wonderful man, et cetera, et cetera. But as her illness progresses, do you suggest or recommend um, a specialist to manage her cognitive decline like a neurologist or I don't know, whatever. I'm just wondering if you know, we're doing the very best we can with her illness. What are your thoughts about that? Thank you. Um, I think it all depends on how the patient is doing and what primary care physician is offering at that moment. Uh, it is not common. Um, I came from education and I was trained in you know, Jefferson University. It's very, um, works a lot with teaching and stuff. We know for sure, we doctors know that there won't be enough pediatricians to satisfy the needs. It won't. Because, and we're not going to talk about that, you know, about education, medical education, and spots, and the money you need, whatever. So, primary care physicians get trained in geriatrics. Family physicians and the medicine physicians, they get trained in geriatrics. We just don't get really enough training. So there's going to be some primary care physicians that feel really comfortable with it, and there's going to be some that are just not comfortable with it. So you've got to see what your primary care physician is, and if there are questions and the illnesses that are not controlled, and you may want to suggest just a consultation. You know, people don't want to lose the primary care physicians, they shouldn't lose the primary care physicians, especially if they have developed that bond, that relationship that is very important. And I'll give you an example. I had a patient that was referred to me, you know, by a doctor somewhere in the valley. 
and that actor is an internal medicine doctor. And basically, the patient was not made just to manage certain things, but the other diseases were keep managed by the primary care physician. So, and I sent copy of the consultation, and I sent copy of my, um, you know, recommendations. So that was kind of an example of a primary care physician. I mean, two primary care physicians because I am not primary care too, but one acting as a geriatric consultant for specific issues. But I would say if somebody is happy with the doctor, they're well managed, they answer the questions they have. You know, if there's no need, there's no need. But if there's questions, if somebody wants another opinion, then that's not going to hurt anybody. We have a question here. Yes. Dr. Starr, did you explain what takes somebody from one uh, provider to another, from the hospital to skilled nursing to rehabilitation to home health, and how they move through that process? Oh, he's learned that. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that is a challenging process. Uh, it is a challenging process. I, I think we, you know, we do, everybody does the best, but it's all the papers and the things. So being involved at the family level on what's going on with the patient. And if you have one doctor that can follow that patient from the hospital to the rehab facility, to their assisted living facility, well, that's great because that doctor knows. Right, but we have an idea. They call me if I transfer a patient from the hospital somewhere, they call me with these medicines. I'm like, no, 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 no. They're not supposed to be on those medications. I took them off. So it is it is a transition, and it's a challenging transition, but that's how it happened. I mean, we when they're in the hospital, we have family meetings, we say, okay, we call social work or case management. We say this patient is gonna need rehab. Where do the family want to send it? How do they choose the place? So they get assistance from that. They get accepted to the place because they first, this rehab place comes and evaluates the patient, checks the insurance, verification, um, change what is the need for the rehab, and get things set up. The doctor writes the order, and then that patient gets picked up by ambulance, or usually by ambulance, and taken to the facility. When they get to the facility, they place them a different room, a different thing. Uh, and then the nurses call the, the doctor to go over the orders in the patient that gets transferred. Um, it's not that simple, but it's not complicated when things flow. Um, it's just about communication. Um, is there anything in specific, Brenda, that you want me to um, talk in terms of like, papers or doctors or facilities? I'm not going to be happy with you. 
because things are going to fall to the cracks and medication. So it is a challenging process. But if you stay on top of it and develop partnerships with the conflict agencies, with the rehabilitation places, with the um, other long-term care places, uh, then things will go a little smooth. You do have to ask for a question. Thank you. Okay. 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 Thank you very much. Thank you. 